So the days where people come to the lab, put some electrodes on, you send them over a machine, those days are over. Um, we're finding that, for instance, why a lot of black people wouldn't go to the lab. I think for the field, it's important to understand sleep within the context of culture, sleep within the context of environment. Addressing patient mistrust is a huge platform for us and one of the major projects that I lead here in the center, mm -hmm. and particularly for their involvement in clinical trial research. And I think that's the hugest barrier, right? You, you mentioned Tuskegee, and I think that's a big issue in the U.S. Especially when you ask people to go sleep somewhere in a strange environment. I don't know what this is about. And truth be told, in those communities, many times somebody slept in the hospital, they never come out alive. So when you say you're going to spend a night at a lab to do a sleep test, there's this, if something bad might happen. But if they're in the comfort of their home, I mean, in our studies, everybody says yes. I think mistrust is the biggest, but rather it's... And it goes both ways. Exactly, exactly. And part of it is just the dynamic of the healthcare system within this country is very profit-driven on one end, and then you have the institutional racism. Why is it that, you know, consistently reported over two or three decades, uh, African Americans report short sleep duration compared with their white counterparts? Uh, why is it that African American men specifically report shorter sleep duration when you look at uh, white males or compared to black women? Here is the deal what we have found. We have found that this is where we see the large chasm in terms of the haves and the have-nots, um, whereby those individuals who have really good insurance, they oftentimes move through that assessment process much faster than others. And so that's one of the major issues. And when you bring that together for a community that's been historically marginalized for so many years, it is a big bridge to build. And it takes time to have those inroads and it takes the community liaison that we entrust so much and oftentimes it just takes consistency and presence and over time if they you know give us an entryway to attend your health fair we build a rapport of trust with an organization and then our name speaks for itself so that trickles out by word of mouth which is the best referral network and recommendation you can go by In our research over the last 10 years, we've been able to engage communities where we need to access uh, black patients, if you will, Hispanic yeah. patients. Yeah. There are ways to do that. And so over the past five years, I think that there has been a significant uptake in the amount of clinical trials that uh, not only include minority populations, but report their results by race and ethnicity. So we have learned quite a bit on what the approaches are to bring them in. What we find, especially in racial ethnic minorities here in New York, that um, uh, quite a lot of individuals um, are at risk for sleep apnea. We also find that by engaging what we call a community steering committee, your life is much easier. So they become the agent of change. And they are oftentimes active in their community boards, in their community centers, in their churches, in their library groups, and they are the ones that can bring the people in here by droves. There's a strategy you can use, so befriending people. You don't want to go to the church the day you want to collect data. You don't want to go to Bobby shop on the day you want to collect data. You may have to go there, get a couple of haircuts, right? And they see a familiar face. You may have to go to church a few times, so they feel, you know what, this guy is one of us, this lady is one of us. And at some point you say, you know what, there's this thing that I'm concerned about. I'm trying to do a little study here. Would you guys like to participate? They'll say yes. But also we train them in motivational interviewing and providing social support. So in some ways they provide not just education about sleep, but how is it that they can provide counseling for these individuals? And it's having them communicate and make it translatable and relatable that is beyond anything anyone here at NYU could do. 
And this has been a fantastic success thus far, whereby we have actually empowered peer health educators. They are the conduits. They are what we call trusted messengers, trusted messengers in the community. Because people are more likely to listen to those individuals than to listen to a doc like myself. Every year we train about 10 to 12 people who can now go do the kind of work community engagement that we are doing in the sleep world. Right. They have more credibility than I do. Even though I go to the community, I do certain things, but I'm not there as frequently as they are. Right. And I don't really exactly look like them. We have to be honest about this. So when they introduce me, they always have to say doctor. When they say doctor, it's like, oh, please don't do that. You know, we're still big brother. We're still um, part of the system, right. if you will, right? And it's almost, you know, having that, the most influential in terms of influence will come from a medical doctor in terms of recommendations, but the most influ is the recommendation from a family or friend member. And there's nothing that really goes beyond that. And when it's something that's positive, that could behoove your health and could engage you in a research project that can change your life ultimately, there's nothing that really replaces that. So we really value our community members. We definitely have been embedded in the community like ethnographers um, in, in a way that will provide us with a deep level of insight. So we engage all the studies that we do. We have a community steering committee that partners with us. And we actually have employed community health folks here where anytime we're developing a study or we're rolling out a new intervention, they are at the, 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 the table, the decision table in helping us to say, is this going to work or this not going to work? Training 25 individuals is good, but the level of scalability might not be as great as we would like it. So what we're currently doing is that we're actually engaging in digital health mobile health applications. We're looking at mobile applications and how do we incorporate sleep, diet, and physical activity so that we're you know, addressing the holistic person but also putting sleep at the forefront. And so peer health education as well as mobile health education is a method, two methods rather, that we have used and improved to be quite successful. Mm -hmm. Some of the work we're doing is about developing and testing new models to make sure people adhere. If you don't adhere, CPAP devices, PAP devices are of no value. We talk a lot about the role of the provider, mm -hmm. and that's important. At the same time, at least my job is to educate patients about how sleep impacts their health overall and how they can start that conversation with their providers. We can't wait for the providers to do it. The patients can take charge. In addition, what we would like to see in terms of treatment, we would really like much more adjunctive support provided to individuals who get the CPAP machine. So as a provider, I may be thinking to myself, what's the likelihood that this patient is going to be adherent to something like CPAP? Uh, this is a patient that I see every month, and we talk about diet. We talk about the importance of, of exercise, and those habits haven't changed as yet. And, and to be quite honest, we're not saying that providers are doing this maliciously or anything like that, but in a big system, a lot gets lost, and it's, it's really in the details. I think that there are several different issues at play in terms of providers having that conversation with their patients about sleep. And... Practically speaking, where would I refer these patients to? I don't know anything about sleep. I, that's not in my network of providers that I regularly refer patients to. Uh, so that's another challenge as well. So there are multiple challenges that providers are faced with. <laughs> then some. Right. And oftentimes, the best way you influence sometimes is with the little one. Whether it's diet, whether it's sleep, if you can influence that because the biggest, brawnest man will be a sweetheart when his little child says, 
you know, it's for them. And you really, you can go through the, the children and try and influence them and educate them. And that's where it can oftentimes start, is with the children. Hopefully you could do something like this for kids as well. Because a lot of kids that are obese, it's deep apnea, yeah. they need help also. So a lot, she, would, she would tell you, a lot of those kids who are not doing well in school have untreated OSA. Oh, it breaks my heart. And there's so many early interventions, especially when you're catching the youth and you're instilling that it's okay to acknowledge your OSA and to wear the mask and take these steps that are needed so that if you need to lose weight or address any other conditions that you need to face that without addressing the OSA, nothing, nothing of them are even probable. Yeah, things that could have been fixed when the kid was four or five years old never happens. These kids never could learn because kid has sleep apnea, why right? kid process information. And by the time you catch, this is too late. You really have to address that underlying cause and sometimes they don't even know they have it. And they're just kind of misdiagnosed and they're put into this category of they're just bouncing off the walls, they're just being a kid and you know they just misbehave, right? And there's really something there that the child may not know how to vocalize or how to express. We had a lot of parents who would come and say, I don't know, uh, my kids is not doing well in school. The guidance counselor said he has a DHD. So I said, okay, I know that's not what's happening. So I said, but tell me, I, I, does he sleep at night? Oh, he, I, it's difficult to wake him up. Have you ever heard him snow at all? Yeah, sometimes he snows, but you know, he's always snored. I'm saying, oh. so. Undetected sleep apnea, untreated sleep apnea leads to what? Hyperactivity. Hyperactivity leads to what? Medication. What would be the best piece of advice that you, you would give to, that you give to your, one of these parents, mother, father, or children right now? I would say to not take it for granted if you hear your child snoring mm -hmm. and to pay attention to the early signs. And if you have any inclination, that something is wrong and, and the, the drowsiness that you're seeing to definitely bring them to get the right care that they need early. What would happen if a patient walked into their doctor's office and said, I want to talk about my high blood pressure, but I also want to talk about my sleep problems. I think there would be a very different conversation. The empowerment is powerful. So we train all those guys for about uh, uh, three weeks. Mm -hmm. They each got a certificate of completion. Imagine what that does. I'm now empowered to actually go and talk about sleep apnea in my community. Patients should feel empowered to discuss their sleep problems with their providers. My biggest reward is when I go to one of those community events, somebody that I saw about six months ago comes back to me and says, Doc, I'm sleeping much better now. It's like... So here's what the, the take-home message in terms of our work. Our work is engagement and empowerment, right? Um, those are the two fundamental um, cores of our work. We engage participants, particularly hard-to-reach participants and patients. This is key, and, and this is where we ultimately believe that, that healthcare needs to go, particularly if we want to increase prevention um, and better management of, of sleep disorders. Thank you for your work. Thank you, thank you.